If there's one actor who has courted controversy, it's Charlton Heston. It didn't start out that way, though, as Heston began his career on stage and went on to make some of the biggest films of his time. So what was his journey like, and how did he go from an imposing hero to a polarizing political figure? Let's take a closer look at Charlton Heston's journey and hear what his daughter has to say, confirming what we've thought all along. He enjoyed an idyllic childhood. Charlton Heston, originally named John Charles Carter, was born in 1923 in Wilmette, Illinois. He wasn't the type of kid who sought attention. His happiest moments were spent exploring the woods and lakes of St. Helen, Michigan, where his family relocated when he was young. He cherished spending time in nature, whether alone or with his father, until he reached the age of ten. That's when his life took a sudden turn. Charlton Heston's parents divorced shortly after he turned ten. His mother remarried a man named Chat Heston a few years later and moved back to Wilmette with her children. The kids eventually took on their stepfather's last name. However, young Heston found it difficult to adjust to his new life and felt like he didn't fit in at his new high school. That all changed when he stumbled upon what would become a lifelong passion, acting. Charlton Heston had already developed a deep love for the stage, and his talent for acting earned him a partial scholarship to study theater at Northwestern University. During his two years there, he crossed paths with Lydia Clark, who was also pursuing theater studies. Love blossomed, and Heston was certain that she was the one he wanted to share his life with. However, winning her over wouldn't be a simple task. Despite knowing what he wanted, Charlton Heston faced disappointment as Lydia, the woman he pursued, didn't share his sentiments. He proposed to her multiple times while they were still in school, only to be turned down each time. As he was getting ready to leave after two years, he decided to reach out to her one last time, even though he anticipated another rejection. To his astonishment, this time things took an unexpected turn. Charlton Heston, who had enlisted in the U.S. Air Force when World War II erupted, seized one final opportunity to propose to Lydia. Much to his surprise and delight, she accepted, and they exchanged vows in a quaint North Carolina church before he embarked on active duty in March 1944. Their journey as a married couple would truly commence upon his return home. After serving as a radio operator and aerial gunner in the Air Force for two years, Heston reunited with Lydia, and the couple decided to pursue opportunities on the stage in New York. Initially, they worked as artists' models before venturing to North Carolina, where they attempted to run their own playhouse for a year. However, their stay there was brief, as Heston had his sights set on other endeavors. Heston's primary goal was to secure work on Broadway, prompting the couple to return to New York in 1948, following their brief stay in North Carolina. This time, however, he had a trick up his sleeve. Around this period, he decided to adopt a new stage name, combining his mother's maiden name, Charlton, with his stepfather's surname, Heston, to create a fresh identity. Whether it was the name change or simply destiny, Broadway welcomed him with open arms this time around. Things were certainly on the rise for Heston upon his return to New York. His portrayal of Proculeus in Antony and Cleopatra on Broadway caught the attention of CBS who then offered him a role in their production of Julius Caesar. This paved the way for several other television roles, one of which grabbed the attention of director Hal Wallace, known for his work on Casablanca. Even though Heston intended to prioritize his stage and television career, he couldn't resist the temptation of accepting Wallace's offer to star in his upcoming film, Dark City. When Lydia reminded him of his original goal, he casually remarked, Well, maybe just for one film to see what it's like. Despite Dark City's lackluster performance at the box office, critics praised Heston's performance in the film. His true breakthrough, a box office success, would arrive shortly after with a Cecil B. DeMille film. Interestingly, DeMille initially hesitated to cast Heston, considering his performance in Dark City too sinister. Luck was on Heston's side when he happened to drive by Paramount Pictures one day to meet some friends. As he was leaving, he spotted Cecil B. DeMille, the director and co-founder of Paramount, 
standing outside his office. Heston greeted him with a smile and a wave. Surprisingly, this simple act of friendliness sparked the director's interest in considering him for his next movie, The Greatest Show on Earth. However, landing the role wasn't without its challenges. Heston described DeMille's casting process as unconventional. It was never clear-cut, leaving the actor uncertain about his chances for the role. DeMille simply informed him about the film, leaving Heston unsure of how to react. After some contemplation, Heston responded with, Sounds like it would make a fine film. And as they say, the rest is history. The success of The Greatest Show on Earth not only established it as a box office hit, but also earned it the prestigious Academy Award for Best Picture. Heston's performance solidified his position in Hollywood, and DeMille recognized him as a rising star. Their subsequent collaboration proved to be another blockbuster, featuring a role that would define Heston's career. Heston's striking appearance was undeniable, with his commanding stature standing at six feet, three inches, muscular physique, sharp features, broad shoulders, and deep voice, he embodied the ideal leading man. DeMille recognized his potential when he visualized Hestod with a beard, seeing a remarkable resemblance to Michelangelo's depicting of Moses. As Heston's career so read, his collaboration with DeMille in the Ten Commandments elevated him to new heights. Portraying the iconic role of Moses, he received acclaim from critics and audiences alike. To prepare for the part, Heston diligently studied passages from the Old Testament. He went the extra mile, even opting to perform barefoot to add authenticity to his portrayal. Enduring the discomfort of Mount Sinai's rocky terrain was a testament to his dedication to his craft. Although not credited in the film, Heston lent his voice to the portrayal of God speaking to Moses from the burning bush. According to the story, he approached DeMille with the idea of doing the voiceover, and DeMille agreed. However, to preserve the mystery surrounding the character of God, DeMille claimed it was an unknown actor whose identity he wouldn't disclose. But Heston's involvement didn't end there. Surprisingly, Another member of his family appeared in The Ten Commandments, his infant son, Fraser C. Heston. DeMille arranged the filming of the scene where baby Moses is placed in a basket on the Nile to coincide with Fraser's age of three months, mirroring the biblical narrative. Following his success in The Ten Commandments, Heston returned to his roots in westerns and adventure films. He starred in Touch of Evil, a thriller alongside Orson Welles, which initially didn't perform well but later gained recognition as a classic masterpiece. Supposedly, Orson Welles was initially slated to only act in Touch of Evil. However, when Heston agreed to star in the film under the impression that Welles was directing it, the producer altered the plans, including the choice of director, to accommodate Heston's preference. Heston greatly enjoyed working with Welles, especially because Wells allowed actors the freedom to interpret their characters and improvise dialogue according to their own understanding. However, not all directors Heston collaborated with were as flexible. He would soon discover this the hard way. Following his experiences with DeMille and Wells, Heston had the opportunity to work with another renowned filmmaker, William Wyler. He landed the lead role in Ben-Hur after actors like Marlon Brando and Rock Hudson passed on the project. Eager for his role in this epic film, Heston wrote an extensive memo filled with suggestions and ideas for his character's first scene. However, he quickly learned that Wyler did not appreciate such input. After the incident, Wyler appeared noticeably distant towards Heston. Eventually, Heston realized that Wheeler had meticulously planned out each scene and character, and he did not take kindly to suggestions that deviated from his vision. Heston was a firm believer in hard work and preparation, and his role in Ben-Hur would truly put his dedication to the test. He arrived on set more than a month before filming, commenced for costume fittings and rigorous practice sessions, particularly for mastering the skill of driving a four-horse chariot. According to Heston himself, it took him a grueling six weeks to learn how to manage four white horses, 
an experience that left his arms feeling like they were about to be pulled out of their sockets. However, this level of commitment was not unusual for Heston, as he consistently demonstrated his dedication to his roles. Ben-Hur not only became the highest-grossing film of its time, but also swept the Academy Awards, winning 11 Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Actor. Heston's nomination in the Best Actor category marked his first and only Oscar nomination, making his win all the more significant. Given Weiler's meticulous attention to detail, it was hardly surprising that Heston's performance resonated so profoundly with audiences. While Heston was known for his unwavering work ethic, it was William Wyler, the director of Ben-Hur, who matched his dedication on set. Heston recounted an incident where he had to film a seemingly straightforward scene of Judah Ben-Hur walking across a room. Despite multiple takes, Wyler remained unsatisfied, leading Heston to inquire about his expectations. What followed was nothing short of extraordinary. Weiler revealed that he was particularly impressed by Heston's action of kicking a pot in the first take and was determined to capture that spontaneous moment again. Despite all his efforts to fully embody his character, there was one aspect of acting that proved challenging for Heston. Crying on cue. Weiler, the director, soon discovered this limitation when Heston struggled to shed tears for a scene. In a creative workaround, Heston resorted to covering his eyes with his hands and simulating sobbing to convey the emotion required. Interestingly, there was an important aspect of Ben-Hur's character that Heston remained unaware of. His romantic involvement with Masala, his friend who later became his betrayer. While this detail was not explicitly stated in either the book or the movie, Gora Vidal, the scriptwriter tasked with refining the original script, interpreted their relationship in this way. Vidal reasoned that Masala's drastic betrayal of Ben-Hur seemed more motivated by personal feelings than mere political differences. To him, it appeared to be the reaction of a spurned lover rather than solely a political adversary. The reason behind Heston's lack of awareness about this interpretation of the characters, however, remains unclear. It turns out that Heston had strong reservations about homosexuality. Weiler, aware of this, instructed Vidal to keep his interpretation of the subtext hidden from Heston to avoid upsetting him. Consequently, only Boyd, the actor portraying Masala, was privy to Vidal's insight, and he attempted to convey it subtly through his performance. Vidal later disclosed this implied assertion in the bathhouse scene between Ben-Hur and Masala in his documentary, The Celluloid Closet, which explored portrayals of homosexuality in Hollywood. However, when Heston learned about Vidal's interpretation in the documentary, he reacted strongly. Not only did he reject Vidal's perspective, but he also denied that Vidal had any involvement in the movie whatsoever. This incident wasn't the only instance where Heston's prejudices became apparent. A few years later, in 1965, Heston enthusiastically took on the role of Michelangelo in an adaptation of Irving Stone's The Agony and the Ecstasy. Despite his initial enthusiasm, Heston later refused to grant Vidal permission to use any scenes from the movie for the celluloid closet. He insisted that his thorough research indicated that Michelangelo was heterosexual. This stance disregarded substantial evidence suggesting that the renowned painter might have been gay. Criticism of Heston's portrayal arose due to the perceived disparity between him and the character he depicted. Despite his strong work ethic, Heston struggled to replicate the success of Ben-Hur in his subsequent films. Following Ben-Hur, he learned deep water diving for his role as a salvage boat pilot in The Wreck of Mary Deerle and meticulously prepared for his portrayal of Michelangelo by immersing himself in the artist's life through extensive reading and practicing, painting and sculpting. However, despite his efforts, these films didn't achieve the desired success at the box office. Undeterred, Heston continued to pursue roles in various genres and also became involved in causes he deeply cared about. Throughout his life, Heston's political affiliations underwent several changes. 
During his most successful period, he staunchly supported the Democratic Party. He vocally opposed the anti-communist campaign led by Republican Senator Joe McCarthy and initially backed presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson, who was unsuccessful before throwing his support behind the victorious John F. Kennedy. However, there was another cause that held a special place in his heart. Heston was known for his unwavering commitment to his beliefs. At a time when many Hollywood celebrities remained silent on the issue, he passionately advocated for civil rights. His support wasn't merely symbolic. He actively participated in demonstrations and was vocal in his advocacy for the cause. Heston held Martin Luther King Jr. in high esteem, often accompanying him during his later speeches and referring to him as the 20th century Moses of the civil rights movement. He also supported Lyndon B. Johnson, who played a pivotal role in passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through Congress, despot facing opposition. Despite his earlier advocacy for civil rights, Heston faced criticism later in his career for controversial choices he made. Some critics began to question the sincerity of his previous activism, suggesting that he may have exaggerated his involvement in the civil rights movement. However, Heston dismissed such doubts, stating that he had supported civil rights long before Hollywood considered it fashionable. Although he was initially aligned with the Democratic Party, Heston's political views shifted significantly in later years. He officially became a registered Republican in 1987, although he had reportedly voted for Republican President Richard Nixon in 1972 as well. Heston attributed his change in party affiliation to what he perceived as a shift in the Democratic Party's values. However, considering his fluctuating opinions over time, some may argue against the consistency of his convictions. Many people may not know this, but initially, Heston was among the Hollywood celebrities who supported and promoted gun control measures, endorsing the Gun Control Act of 1968. However, his stance on this issue underwent a complete reversal over the years, transforming him into one of the nation's staunchest advocates for gun ownership and a prominent supporter of the NRA. Despite his primary profession as an actor, Heston also actively engaged in various committees. Inspired by his friend and role model Ronald Reagan, he served as the president of the Screen Actors Guild from 1966 to 1971. Additionally, he assumed the role of co-chairman of Reagan's Task Force on Arts and Humanities, defending it against accusations of elitism. For five years, Heston held the position of president at the NRA, a role that, while largely ceremonial, solidified his fervent advocacy and positioned him as the face of the organization for the remainder of his life. However, his commitment to political activism did not detract from his acting career. Quite the contrary. Despite his involvement in politics, Heston continued to pursue acting with dedication. Although he didn't replicate the monumental success of Ben-Hur, several of his films achieved significant box office success. These included epic productions like El Cid and Major Dundee, as well as sci-fi classics like Planet of the Apes and The Omega Man. He even ventured into full-fledged action films later in his career. Among his filmography, Will Penny held a special place in Heston's heart. While it didn't fare well commercially, he considered it his personal favorite. The film garnered praise from critics for his departure from his typical macho image, portraying a more nuanced and understated character. Heston initially pursued a career on stage, so transitioning back to it when film opportunities dwindled wasn't too difficult for him. He even ventured into primateam television starring in the soap opera The Colbys for two years. In the late 1980s, he collaborated with his son Fraser, Remember the Baby Moses, to produce and appear in several TV movies. Not content with just acting, Heston expanded his repertoire by hosting Saturday Night Live twice and making a cameo appearance in an episode of Friends during the 1990s. Despite staying active in the industry, he had interests beyond acting. Heston candidly revealed his battle with alcoholism, acknowledging that while he hadn't reached the point of slurred speech or stumbling, he recognized the grip alcohol had on him and sought help before it worsened. 
Some speculate whether his struggles with alcohol influenced his infamous speech at the NRA convention. When Michael Moore interviewed Heston for his documentary, Bowling for Columbine, asking about his stance on gun control in the wake of school shootings, it ended abruptly. Heston affirmed his support for the Second Amendment, suggesting that the prevalence of such incidents in the U.S. could be attributed to mixed ethnicity or historical factors. He then abruptly ended the interview, prompting criticism of both Moore's tactics and Heston's remarks. Heston had opposed the Vietnam War, but he was a staunch supporter of the Iraq War. He was outspokenly anti-abortion and strongly criticized political correctness, arguing that it stifled free expression. He once addressed Harvard Law students, emphasizing the importance of being able to express one's opinions openly and without censorship. Heston's health declined rapidly following his announcement of Alzheimer's disease. Towards the end, he was confined to his bed, unable to move according to accounts from family and friends. Nonetheless, he persevered for another six years before passing away from pneumonia at the age of 84 in April 2008. His wife and children remained by his side during his final moments. While many disagreed with his beliefs and principles, there's no denying that his death marked the end of an era. His passing prompted mourning from various quarters, with tributes pouring in from figures like George W. Bush, who had honored him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom during what would be his last public appearance, as well as Nancy Reagan and numerous others. Over 250 individuals attended his funeral, including many Hollywood luminaries. Following his death, Heston received numerous posthumous honors, including induction into the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum's Hall of Great Western Performers. Additionally, he was posthumously inducted as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, the state's highest honor, receiving the Order of Lincoln. Holly and Fraser's warm memories of their father. Charlton Heston's children were naturally impressed by their father's fame as a film star, but at home, away from the spotlight of the big screen, the Planet of the Apes star revealed a much softer side. According to Holly and Fraser, Heston was a warm and approachable man who always prioritized his family. Unlike many of his peers, Charlton managed to balance his family life, career, and activism. As he became a champion for civil rights and other causes, he demonstrated courage and conviction. To those who only knew him from his film roles, Charlton might seem like a conservative and stern figure straight out of the Old Testament. However, Fraser insisted that despite his political views, Charlton was anything but rigid. To him, Charlton was a loving, engaging, and humorous individual. Lydia, Fraser, and Holly witnessed Charlton's softer side firsthand. To them, this aspect of his personality was his most heroic trait. Fraser praised Charlton as a patient father, while Holly shared with Closer magazine that her father cherished quality time together. Whenever he was with her, he was fully present. Although he could have easily been consumed by his work, Charlton saw acting as a means to support his family. He was determined not to stray from that path and neglect his domestic responsibilities. Both of Charlton's children understood the depth of his devotion to their mother. Charlton and Lydia had been college sweethearts, seizing the opportunity to marry in 1944. During World War II, Charlton served as an aerial gunner, but his thoughts were always with Lydia back home. Their bond remained unbreakable throughout the war and beyond. In his later years, Charlton openly acknowledged that he wouldn't be the person he was without Lydia by his side. However, it wasn't only his family that shaped Charlton's character. His unwavering convictions played a significant role as well. Charlton stood beside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the Lincoln Memorial during the Civil Rights Movement, understanding the importance of taking a stand, even when it was unpopular. Throughout his life, Charlton never shied away from showing courage, and no one could question his compassionate nature. During the Vietnam War, 
he embarked on three tours to visit troops on the front lines. Upon returning home, he made it a priority to personally reassure their loved ones of their well-being. Fraser shared with Closer, You'd think that after serving in World War II, someone would receive a get-out-of-public-service-free card, but Charlton didn't see it that way. He remained dedicated to helping others, even when it demanded a great deal of his time and energy. Charlton's courage never wavered. Even in the face of Alzheimer's disease, which ultimately led to his passing at the age of 84 in 2008, Holly recalled that her father confronted his illness with dignity and grace. She remarked that there were no empty buckets on his bucket list, as he felt truly fulfilled with the richness of his life. Sophia Loren drove Charlton Heston crazy. While Charlton's children held their father in high regard, it seems he didn't see eye to eye with everyone in Hollywood. Reportedly, the Hollywood tough guy declined to make eye contact with his co-star Sophia Loren during their renowned love scene in El Cid. For the film's pivotal death scene, Heston later claimed he was instead looking off into the future rather than facing Loren. Even critics couldn't ignore this detail in their reviews. While many men, whether actors or not, would have relished the opportunity to work with Loren, Heston didn't seem impressed by her looks or talent. In 1960, when Loren was captivating audiences worldwide, having signed a significant five-film deal with Paramount in 1956, Charlton saw it differently. Despite appearing alongside Hollywood heavyweights like Clark Gable, Frank Sinatra, and Cary Grant, and delivering standout performances in films such as It Happened in Naples, The Pride and the Passion, Houseboat, and The Millionaires, Lauren's allure didn't resonate with Heston. In her relatively short time in the limelight, she had already proven herself as a talented actress, excelling in both drama and comedy. Her performance in Two Women even earned her the distinction of being the first person to win an acting Oscar for a non-English language film. So, what rubbed Heston the wrong way? When they both signed on for El Cid, Heston was already a major film star, having won an Oscar for Ben-Hur in 1959. Being the director's top choice for the lead role, he felt a strong sense of responsibility and ownership over the project. However, when Lauren joined the cast, equally famous and acclaimed, she too asserted her opinions and desires for the film. Upon her arrival, she began making demands. Allegedly, she insisted on rewriting the script to include more romantic scenes for her character, Dona Shimena. Moreover, she agreed to only film for eight to ten weeks, forcing a reshuffle of the movie's filming schedule. On top of it all, she demanded a hefty paycheck. Some reports suggest she pocketed one million dollars for the role, while others offer a more modest estimate of two hundred thousand dollars. Either way, she was earning more than Heston. But that wasn't all. Lauren began making unreasonable demands, such as insisting that the script be translated into Italian and then back into English to suit her preferences. Over time, Heston grew weary of Lorenz's diva-like behavior. Things became so tense on set that he insisted on having a stand-in body double for close-up scenes that only featured Lorenz's face. As the situation worsened, the director, Anthony Mann, struggled to get Heston to even look at Lauren. This wasn't the first time Heston clashed with a co-star, though, on the set of Cecil B. DeMilla's epic biblical film, The Ten Commandments, Yul Brynner fiercely resisted being overshadowed by his alpha male co-star. Heston landed the role of Moses, towering over Yul Brynner, who stood at 5'7", compared to Heston's 6'3" but Brynner wasn't about to let the height difference dim his presence on screen. Upon discovering that Ramesses would be shirtless for much of the lengthy film, Brynner hit the gym hard, sculpting his physique. Beyond just wowing audiences with his toned abs and stellar acting, Brynner earned Heston's admiration. Despite any initial rivalry, Heston later acknowledged Brynner's performance as the film's standout. Quite a display of humility, wouldn't you say? Despite being one of Hollywood's iconic tough guys, Heston's children paint a different picture of him, that of a devoted family man willing to do anything for his loved ones. 
While history may not always shine favorably on stars of the past, especially the men, Charlton Heston seems to have been a man of a different caliber. He embodied values, courage, and unwavering convictions. In conclusion, Charlton Heston's legacy extends far beyond his iconic roles on the silver screen. Through the eyes of his children, we glimpse a man of integrity, dedication, and familial love. Despite his towering presence in Hollywood, he remained grounded in his values and commitments. Now, we turn to you, our audience. What do you think is Charlton Heston's most enduring legacy? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more captivating insights into the life and legacy of Charlton Heston. See you next time. Bye.